I hear so many players say that flex play and improvising in TFT is dead, especially months into a set where all the lines and comps feel like they're figured out. If you aren't following tier lists and data, you are trolling. Well, in this episode of Into Deep, we join Shunga, former set seven world champion and currently 2000 LP rank three in China. He plays a wild game of TFT full of twists and turns and things that I couldn't have predicted. I hope that by the end of this video, you too are inspired to pick up your spatulas and start cooking again. So Shunga currently sits at around 2000 LP at rank three in China. He is the former world champion from set seven Dragonlands, and looks like almost everybody is on the new portal hall of the nine which is really exciting because at the beginning of each stage you get offered a different reward based off of whatever the loot table says and everybody gets that so if you get an item component everyone's getting an item component if you get a tome everybody gets a tome Sometimes you get a two-star unit that scales off a of stage, so you get some crazy stuff like at stage five, everyone gets a legendary two-star. So this is a really chaotic, high-resource portal. It's possible that you don't get anything as well. Sometimes you get something like a boot, but if that ends up happening, nobody gets any rewards, so you're okay. Start things off with getting a Callista and a Garen. Callista is actually a really good unit to build around in particular because of the challenger synergy. Even getting things like the Shadow Isles on a Maokai or VAO can be really powerful. Usually you play Garen if you're really high rolling early with a lot of, you know, two star Poppy and, and then you have like a Demacia going early and then you have an item for Garen immediately like a Rage Blade or a BT. But because he doesn't really have anything like that, I think you're just going to sell Garen and pick up everything else. Focus on pairing up the Poppy, focus on picking up other good synergies with this Irelia Jin. Oh, he actually ends up holding onto the Garen instead. And this is really interesting because you don't actually see people hold the Garen. I would think that most people would hold on to things like the Poppy pair and then play around the possibility of maybe re-rolling around the Poppy. But in this case, he's going to hold on to the Garen just for the optionality. And he does have the Juggernaut link to the set. So he's open to multiple things. He's open to a Challenger opening. He's open to a Garen potential re-roll, which is quite unusual. You usually don't see a lot of Garen right now. But maybe because Garen got buffed, it's better on this patch. Ends up selling it anyways, goes for the Soraka and the Orianna instead. Okay, so let's pause here and take a look at his augments. He starts off with tons of stats, parting gifts, and harmonists too. In terms of what is generically the strongest, a lot of times tons of stats is just nice to have because it basically makes all your units a little bit stronger. So in terms of having a head-to-head -head where you're equal in power level, you're going to have that edge because of the combat augment. Parting gifts is usually good with two specific items if you get an early zz rot because then you're passing that zz rot around we've done an in too deep about this already with dish soap and sorcerer so you can check that out if you want the other would be war mogs because war mogs will pass that hp buff to every unit that it gives the item to so you could think about it but he doesn't have either the war mogs or the zz rot ready to go so it makes me feel like this is not the spot for parting gifts armistice is kind of similar to like a celestial blessing where it actually doesn't do that well early game, but gets a lot better as you get more damage and as you scale your composition. So I would reroll at least the parting gifts and the harm assist and reevaluate. He rerolls immediately one option. He's still holding on to the possibility of parting gifts, but he finds magic wand and magic wand is potentially pretty good. It's a very strong augment for a bunch of AP comps and he was holding on to things like the Soraka plus the Oriana, so he's open to playing AP. Not to mention that Shunga is primarily known as a strong AP player, even though he's capable of playing a bunch of different things. I'm curious if he wants to reroll everything here. Think about parting gifts at this spot, but I really don't think there's a ton of value here unless you can get the tempo early. So he finds early education, combat caster. In fact, these are really good augments for invokers, and he does have an invoker start with the Soraka. He could think about early education, which is something that not a lot of people pick because people feel like you'd rather go for the guarantee, like a magic wand over early education. But if you think about it, outside of the rod that you get from the magic wand, the early education will outscale it. And so if you can start off with it in the beginning of the game, and hold onto specific units like that Soraka, maybe Castillo hit the invokers, you're in a really good spot. It's a little bit of a shame that this ends up being our augment selection because these are all really good for invokers. So I would choose all of them if I could. Uh, but I think early education here makes a lot of sense. Oh my god! Immediately we're given a tactician's crown. And so the tempo of the lobby is really accelerated. So everyone will want to try to play high tempo. And so Shunga here at this spot needs to actually slam items and play for tempo. And this brings us to a really important point. 
If you are in a high tempo lobby with things like tacticians crowns and plus ones early, be prepared to play on low economy. This means that you're going to have to min max the board strength without having to roll as much because you have an extra unit on the field. That means you're less likely to hit your interest points because you're hitting your interest points that less often. You have to hold on to pairs a little bit more aggressively and also be willing to level to seven and eight a little bit slower. So low economy games really challenge your ability to put power into things like your traits as opposed to the unit quality because you're going to have to compensate for the lack of upgrades that you're getting able to consistently hit with things like board synergy as well as unit combinations. So we hit Warwick and now we have a Juggernaut as part of our front line. This is a really good call out. Scouts around and sees the boss. Also, there's Riftwalk, I believe. Wait, what the heck? Demon Flare? <laughs> I believe this means that there's a handful of two cost rerollers in a lobby where you start off with Tactician's Crown. That's kind of crazy for a lot of reasons. One, these two cost rules have a little bit higher tempo because things like the boss and potentially the Swain with Demon Flare is going to be tempoing early. We take a pretty big loss. We slam a tier to see if we can preserve HP. We didn't really be successful with that. And so now we're not killing as many units for early education. This is a really awkward spot here, I think. Yeah, there's Riftwalk and there's the boss and there's Demon Flare. So at least three people, two cost rerolling which should encourage us theoretically to potentially go for a two cost reroll. This brings us to another tip. You want to try to reroll alongside the cost that everybody else is rerolling as well. So if half the lobby is rolling for one cost, you want to pick a one cost. If half the lobby is rolling for two cost, you want to roll for a two cost. I mean, this is because there's going to be fewer of those ones, twos and three costs into the pool. So you can just draw them out and it ends up being a situation where maybe all of you hit super head of curve. So Maybe this is something he's thinking about of trying to play things like the Soraka. He's holding Cassio, but not playing it either. But these are the invokers that he's thinking about because I do think the early education with the AP is really good for invokers. Keep in mind, by the way, that a lot of times the reason why you want things like AP on invokers uh, instead of mana is because you already get a lot of mana. So because you're casting a lot, you end up wanting to have AP to deal damage. If you end up having like blue buff on, say, a Karma or Cassiopeia, you just get more of the same thing, which is mana. You want to actually multiply your damage through things like AP, crit, bonus damage, as opposed to just keep stacking more mana and tickling your opponent. If we have an open tier, I imagine that we probably want to go for rods. That's also a Taric, by the way. So this is really strong. The rod can build into either Gunblade or Spark or a Jewel Gauntlet. All three of these items are really important because the spark is good for shred the jewel gauntlet is good for the crit because you have so much base ap scaling from things like the early education and then you also get gunplay which can heal your front line i think a common misunderstanding that people have with invokers in particular is that they think that you want to focus on your backline items when you do want to have some important items like Gunblade and Jewel Gauntlet, but at the same time, you also really want to have good frontline. Invokers are similar to a shielding stall composition. So you're thinking about enchanters in the past, like in set six gizmos and gadgets or Seraphine Graves from set seven Dragonlands. You really focus on having the battle of attrition. You want to outscale them by having too much shielding and healing through things like Targon and Shen tanking forever with the Taric providing the adjacent shields. So a lot of times people will think, okay, I need, I need to go three item on my backline invoker, like a Karma, and then I start building frontline items. That's how you build it in a couple of other AP compositions, but not this one. You want to focus on having that sustained frontline. Another way to think about it is also we have combat augments that give us more power. So because we have already more offense to things like early education, we want to focus on things like defense. And we don't have any defensive items, by the way. A lot of times people think like Sunfire could be a defensive item because we put it on a frontline unit. In this case, it's set. But in reality, it's actually an offensive item because it does give you a little bit of HP and armor but it's focused on dealing damage and burning your opponent's HP down to stop the anti-heal. So in this case, it's actually just all pure offense from him. So he has to think about that moving forward. I do like that he's still going for things like the set and the Warwick, by the way, because it does feel like his strongest board as opposed to just playing like more of the same thing. If he wasn't playing set and Warwick, I'd probably recommend playing things like a double Taric and a, another Soraka. I do think double Taric is pretty underrated because they end up shielding each other. This used to actually be a bug that they fixed and we hit Taric 2, which is massive power spike and anchors our front line that much more. Now we hit a second Callista. So the question will be, do we transfer these items to the Callista or do we lean into the Callista pair? 
because the thing is we we have been stacking this cluster for quite some time and we do have a rod committed to it so it would feel a little bit bad if we end up selling the cluster the downside is he's not making 20 gold okay well he did end up hitting the orb there with gold but there's a chance that he didn't make it but you know what now that i'm thinking about it hall of nine gives you a bunch of extra resources oh my gosh he got an orn anvil and a Callista too uh so this is a really interesting spot because we talked about how he doesn't have frontline and so with the if you pick something like anima visage that does give you the ability to anchor that front line that being said anima visage is not exactly the strongest frontline item the two items that you actually care about the most in this composition for frontline on the orn anvil would be eternal winter or randuins randuins is really good because you get so much shield and you're able to have that Tarek and the shen almost like feel like they go infinite because the resistances on the shield actually stack where you're able to cast a little bit more often and as a result heal with more gun blades and more shielding it's very very strong with that recursive healing dfg is interesting because it's just a powerful way to nuke and also we have things like this uh Callista 2 really early on so maybe he wants to play around that he can go for jg plus a deathfire grasp and try to nuke targets down very quickly Fisher's glass is also potentially really good because you can also go onto Callista and then have double Callista stack her spears onto the same target which will end up rending much more quickly and so Trisha's Glass Callista 3 is a complete win condition with the stacking ability power of early education can also be really powerful so I could see a case for either of these offensive items I think Anima Visage is probably the weakest of choice out of all of them they did change Deathfire Grass very recently oh interesting wow we go for a Taric because we recognize that frontline was a little bit of our weakest issue and so now he's stacking with double Taric and you know what he also even has things like a remover so if he needs to move that later on he can totally have that optionality but he's recognizing that the two Taric synergy is actually really good because look the first Taric shields which potentially helps the second Taric shield as well that being said he did die a little bit quickly if he was able to position slightly more optimal you can even have the two Terex sandwiched between uh, your outside frontliner so you could go like set Terex Terex Warwick or inverse uh, of that positioning in order to get maximum Terex value but still really good spot and now all of a sudden two star Terex two star Callista and I wonder if he's going to lean into this oh some really interesting choices now some really interesting choices so Targon Soul is particularly very good if you're able to lean into either Shadow Isles or you go into the Invokers because you get a free redemption and you get that Taric. Although I think the Taric is worse because we sold the previous Taric and we already have Taric 2, so we're not chasing Taric 3. It's also lower economy, so definitely harder to chase three stars at this moment. Endless Hordes is actually quite a strong augment and the best time to pick it is specifically here at 3-2 because you get such a big power spike and in the end you actually would go for power in your traits so in this case he would go for either vertical shadow wilds vertical challengers or vertical invokers and endless hordes is really good with those vertical traits right like if you play endless hordes I highly recommend trying things like eight sorcerers or nine Ionia nine Noxus or nine Sharima they, these kinds of really powerful things if he doesn't have a plus one though endless hordes is a little bit weaker so I would say that either of these options are really good the third secret option that he could potentially take here is ancient archives too so he can go for things like a shadow isle emblem and I think that that's actually potentially really good as well because shadow isles with things like the Taric will also be really strong until you're able to get Shadow Isles onto another frontliner like Shen or potentially even Kasante. So if Shunka chooses to go for Ancient Archives, it means that he's going for the max cap of trying to have Shadow Isles with early education stacking the AP on the Callista. Very exciting choices here. He rerolls Endless Hordes, finds another Titician Crown's opportunity. I don't think that's good. Tiniest Titans has lost a lot of value in this spot already. So he's thinking about ancient archives and the thing about ancient archives is it depends on the number of traits that you have active so starting from six eight and then ten and twelve that's how many active traits that you need in order to guarantee tailored traits so currently shunga has one two three four active traits one two three four five six inactive traits so he has ten this means that three traits will be tailored and one will be random so he can get anything from 
the Targon, all the way down to the Ionia. Sometimes in these situations, you try to go for some traits that you can't get active. So it's interesting that he has a Teemo in the shop because Teemo offers Yordle and Multicaster. So let's say he leveled to six here and played Teemo and didn't use his Tome. And he would get Yordle and Multicaster to count towards the traits and he would get four tailored. He doesn't have the ability to get things like Yordle and Multicaster because there's no such emblem in the set currently. So he has a couple of different options here. The most common thing to do here in this spot is to use one Tome and then evaluate what you get, then try to build around that. So let's say he rips the tome and gets something like Shadow Isle Emblem, then he could try to build the board that's leaning more towards that, and then uh, use it later on this stage. He has a choice between Shadow Isle Emblem, Invoker, Challenger, and Targon. These are literally all the four traits that I think I would be looking for in this spot. From here, I would be really tempted to take Shadow Isle Emblem. I feel like the vertical Shadow Isles with Targon particularly is really, really powerful. I don't think it's an Invoker spot because it looks like we're playing around Callista, so it's going to be challenger or the shadow isles and he goes for challenger emblem which is interesting but i think it's because he has a fourth challenger right now if he took the shadow isles then he would be going for four shadows with viego which feels a lot worse and he wants to lean ultimately into callista which right now the vertical shadow isles doesn't help nearly as much as the four challenger if you think about it without things like that attack speed that Callista won't be attacking very much with the spears and not be able to rend opponents very quickly. So he's thinking about the immediate. I would say, though, that this wasn't actually very strong as much as I thought it would be. I think that in hindsight, I would have gone for Shadow Isles and tried to go for four Shadow Isles, ultimately going for six. Because six Shadow Isles with Targon, I think, is very OP. But I'm really interested to see how this challenger line ends up developing. Second Tome, by the way, was not very good. He got a Bastion Emblem. The only other option I think he could take was the... Uh, invoker because everything else was not really viable now we're going up against someone has transfusion three and a frail yord so they're going to lean most likely into zeri so it's good it doesn't look like we're very contested in this line and that could also be another factor into what shunga is thinking about which is you know he's trying to play an uncontested line a lot of people are not thinking about challengers in this kind of lobby it's kind of a shame that we snapped our streak though but the good news is that we are still pretty healthy from this point on we need another item for Callista. a lot of times people like to go for a jewel gauntlet or a gun blade off of the open rod you might even think about going for something like rage blade Rageblade is pretty unique with Callista because she's an attack speed carry. You actually really like having attack speed on her, even though challengers give her attack speed. This is not the case for a lot of other challenger champions. If you look at Kaisa, for example, I think it's a mistake to build Rageblade on her while going for vertical challengers because you get a lot of attack speed. And then when she finally casts, she doesn't deal that much damage. But with Callista, the more attack speed she gets, the faster she's going to stack those spears, which is the most amount of her damage. She does do a little bit of physical as well, but I think that's like really, really important. Shunga, by the way, is taking out his builder and trying to see what the comp looks like, which is to play around four Shadow Isles plus the challengers if he is actually going for this build though i personally believe that he should have gone for a plus one shadow isles because shadow isle emblem is really good on that kaisa and that the shen instead but hey i think that in the end he landed in a pretty decent spot his tempo is still really high he going up against the boss with a radiant titans his tempo is actually not working out nearly as well as i was hoped for and i think that in the end he took ancient archives to try and maximize the amount of tempo that he had right here and right now but he ended up losing two out of three but it's really cool because i think that challenger emblem does have a pretty high ceiling because if you get challenger emblem on things like the heimerdinger or a belveth or an atrox it's actually quite good he's going up against riff walker now who took tiniest titans no one is really hitting a lot of those early two cost three stars sometimes you see some crazy early spikes especially with someone who rolled down as much as they did but his opponent has tiniest titans with 20 gold and trying to heal back into the game because i think some of these rerollers are taking too much punishment from the high tempo and this brings us to a separate tip this is not relevant to shunga's game in particular but if you are playing in a high tempo lobby reroll is weaker by having things like plus one units on the board you just take much more damage for loose streaking and things like these reroll comps that need all that extra time and economy in order to get online just take way too much damage, in my opinion. So the question here that Shunga has to think about is how much does he want to roll on seven? Is he going to actually roll until he hits, you know, two star everything? Is he going to full pivot his board and sell these two star Tarex? Another tome has dropped. 
And so now we open up another tome, but what is this? We get Zahn from the Warwick, Sorcerer from the Taric. And that's it. We have nine traits on the side, which means we only get two tailored. Oh man, that's actually some of the worst ones possible. It's definitely not Sorcerer from here because we open Challenger and it's not Zahn because I don't even know what the Zahn mod is. And long term, we're not even really trying to play around the Zahn mod. The only Zahn mod that I think that could potentially be really good is Robotic Arm because then you give Callista like a big attack speed steroid and she just gets a lot of attacks going actually the more i think about it the more zon mod actually might be correct which would be really interesting i mean everything else is not really pickable here like strategist failure like what are we gonna do with that okay i think i'm down for the zon mod and see what we can do with the mod on our champion based on what we get we have an echo so we can actually immediately see what the zon mod is his bench is too full so he stands a rage blade first the Zon mods have also changed. Oh my God, we hit an Aatrox. That's a great holder of Town Dremlin, by the way. Okay, so we take the Aatrox out here and he looks at the Zon mod. And it looks like it's robotic arm, which is actually quite good if he put it onto the Callista, like we talked about. Uh, the only thing is that he put it onto his Soraka. And this is actually really smart because he recognizes that Soraka is not going to stay. And so in terms of like who's a good temporary holder of it so that he can make sure that he's putting Zon emblem on the correct target, he put it on a unit that he can sell first. So this brings us to an important tip. If you don't know who to put a specific item on, put it on the unit that you think will be sold first. All right, let's pause here. If you're playing challengers, you have a lot of attack speed. And so you want actual stats to back it up. So I think social distancing makes the most sense here. Return on investment is not particularly important. We already have a tactician's crown, so I don't feel like we benefit too much from having two. The only argument to having a second Tactician's Crown is maybe you can go something for like eight Challenger really early on level seven, but we don't have two Challenger emblems, so I don't think that's possible. Capricious Forge is actually quite solid of an item onto certain champions like a Yasuo. So if we feel like we just want more items onto champions and get our tempo higher in that sense, then I think that's also fine. But I would probably reroll the first and third options if I were to choose two of the three. I still think social distancing is quite good. The only thing about social distancing is that social distancing gives us flat stats like AP, which we already have. He rolls into a Targon heart as well. That's kind of crazy. Could have gone for like vertical Targon and Shadow Wilds this game. Completely different line. But I think we've shown that we're not going to stay on Targon very long. So I think that we are probably going to go for social distancing here. Scope weapon... I was going to say is one of the weakest augments currently in the game because nobody picks this augment ever since we have lost a bunch of melee carries that could potentially use it. But he goes for scope weapons anyways, puts the robotic arm onto a Kai'Sa, and he's backlining the Yasuo because the Yasuo does benefit from the range extension. Going for BT on Yasuo because he doesn't really need as much uh, things like Edge of Night since he's not going the front line. I will say, though, that this is a really interesting spot. I've never seen someone really take scope weapons, but he gets a lot of attack speed, gets range extension on the Callista, the Kaisa, the Yasuo. Oh, man, this guy is cooking. Finds six Callista as well. I'm just going to be honest. I really haven't seen this board before, so I'm going to be watching alongside most of you and kind of analyzing on the fly. Finds Gwen. Gwen is currently very good in the metagame, and this is my problem with, I think, itemizing something like BT on Yasuo is that it wasn't particularly very strong, uh, especially because it's a one-star Yasuo, and in the end, I might want to itemize another champion, like let's say this Gwen. I think one star Gwen it, with this challenger emblem is comparable, if not stronger, than the one star Yasuo if you just give her uh, the BT. This is because Gwen is a little bit tankier than Yasuo and she's able to sustain throughout the fight, have synergy with that Shadow Isle emblem. So, you know, you're able to get that shield stacking, which is really good and keep her in the fight. Either way, he's streaking and he's now chasing Callista 3. And I just got to say, man, this is a really cool board. I haven't actually seen something like this before. I think his win condition ultimately will be laying into challenger on a senna and then senna gets the attack speed while stacking that shield getting something like maybe the targon back in which is going to be a little bit tricky but he could possibly do it at eight because he does have that extra spot with the tactician's crown and then get things like the targon shielding with the senna and be able to stack a bunch of attack speed all right we find a scion and we're still rolling here i think we're rolling because we have so many pairs we have okay, now we have eight callistas we have a warwick pair a kaisa pair a Shen that we finally found and he's going to start making that replacement so we can get the Ionia in. 
Okay, so we go for a Trickster's Glass onto the Shen here. I do think our front line is still the weakest part of our composition, so I think the Trickster's Glass on the Shen makes sense. Going up against the boss, still on set two, and as a result, gets kind of a, another really powerful win. In general, things like Callista can counter a lot of these sets that are hard to kill. Really good single target DPS. And I wonder if he's going to roll again here because he's streaking. He probably thinks that he's so close to hitting things like Callista 3, that Kaisa 2, Warwick 2 is a really big deal. And so he's going to roll again. Shen pair. So now we have four things to hit. Five. We have Yasuo. That's so infuriating. Okay, we hit a Callista 3 at the very least. And that's one of the most important ones. And he's going to think about replacing this Yasuo and move this BT. Kind of similar to what we talked about. Ah, uh, yeah. So this is this is Shunga basically admitting that he made a minor mistake here. He still got value off of the Bloodthirster, but I'm pretty sure that it was better on a unit like Gwen. Easy to say, though, because he didn't have the Gwen when he slammed it. So he didn't want to use that remover. He wanted to save it for the possibility of using it in the late stages of the game. I'm not entirely sure how I feel about that because... What else do we want to use the remover on is my question. I think now you're starting to recognize a little bit of kind of how smart it is to go for Callista in a lobby where there's like the boss, there's Demon Flare, potentially even that Rift Walker, because there's like these single solo frontline tank slash carry units with hero augments that Callista can take down. And if you take out those units quickly, you end up having a massive advantage. And the reward is a bunch of gold. So we can go to level eight and now roll. Going to level eight here because rolling at seven, he's pretty much just rolling for two star four cost. And he gets to go to level eight to potentially fit in really powerful synergy. Finds another Yasuo. Ends up prioritizing the Gwen with a JG as well, which I kind of like. And now is moving the Zon mod onto the Yasuo to give him the robotic R. So really interesting setup. And now he's not really playing around Kaisa carry whatsoever. Flexed around playing this Kalista and then going into a Yasuo, Kaisa, Gwen trio rotation. I really like the way he's trying to maximize and stack his items. And this is a really important thing. You don't want to spread your items. You want to stack them onto a carry. If you end up having a spot where you're like, okay, well, you know, theoretically, Jewel Gauntlet is good onto this Kaisa, and then BT is good onto this Yasuo, and then you put like a Challenger Emblem on Gwen, you end up having a lot of items spread out and as a result you're not multiplying the power you're just adding those parts together and you really want to get those items stacked on top of each other going up against a binary airdrop our positioning is probably going to be really important to nail it's a little bit awkward though because we have scope weapons so we want to put some things into the back line dead eye ended up being kind of scary because it almost deleted our uh, entire backline, but thankfully our close to three has too much HP. And now Shunga is in a spot where I'm pretty sure he's guaranteed top four. The question is, can he play for more than top four? I feel like a lot of these other boards that get online are starting to be a little bit scary. Things like the Rift Walker, which scale, or things like you know the the three star jinx the dead eyes and frail yards i think we struggle with dps if our callista is not able to kill quickly a lot of our items are stuck onto a gwen one as opposed to a kaisa two in fact there's an argument that you should probably sell this gwen here put the challenge emblem onto the senna and then put two items onto either yasuo or kaisa instead but he does want to play around gwen because i think gwen is the better champion if you can hit her a two star so he's waiting he's not exactly rushing i think a lot of people here would be too quick to just sell the unit and he's streaking this brings us to another concept which is make your opponents prove to you that you have to roll he doesn't have to mess with success right like what if he changes everything and all of a sudden he starts losing then you start to question did i make my board weaker or was it really good to change and i just got unlucky with the fight just make sure in these kinds of spots that you just roll with what's working and then make your opponent prove that you have to do something pretty radical in order to improve your board and, and start to win finds a gunblade onto this yasuo if i were to be really nitpicky i would say that you would want gunblade onto the gwen and then you would have the bt onto the yasuo but in the end it's totally fine because He's just trying to play whatever he can get right now. Has to be careful about that Zephyr, by the way, because if that Zephyr lands onto something like that Aatrox, that Darius could walk all the way around. He's trying to position intentionally to keep his Calista safe. A lot of Noxus players end up putting a Zephyr onto the top corner and then try to Zephyr your top most corner defensive unit and have things like the Darius walk all the way around to start immediately targeting the backline unit. Okay, so we do lose our first fight in quite some time here. So now we have to think about if we want to actually change some things around. And you can start to see that he's entertained the idea of, you know, maybe we replace Gwen, but we don't even have a good replacement unit, quite frankly. Funny enough, this is kind of one of those situations where we, if we had a plus one Shadow Isles, our spot would also be really ridiculous. Wait, speaking of ridiculous, I think his opponent has six Noxus, six Juggernauts. Surely we're guaranteed at least top two from here, right? Oh, we just ate a Zephyr. 
a good fake out. His opponent was showing as if he was going to go for a frontline Zephyr, but instead he goes for the target backline, and Kalista is the majority of our damage. Dude, holy smokes. I can't believe he has Katarina 3 with Juggernaut and Azonias. That Katarina is very tanky. All right, well, six Juggernaut, six Noxus is very strong and hard to deal with. But you know what's interesting is that Kalista theoretically should get past the damage reduction because it doesn't matter if they reduce the damage. Uh, Kalista's just Spears is going to take them out one by one. But the problem is that his front line isn't strong enough to hold up against the a bunch of Noxus stacks. So I think from here, he should consider rolling. I know that's kind of weird to roll when you have so much HP and you might... Oh my god, Hall of the Nine just gave him a Scion. Okay, so surely we got to get the Scion in. If we're looking for a good item here, you can try to go for more DPS. He's going to roll here for Gwen 2. If you can find Gwen 2, he's in a good spot. Otherwise, I am down to move these items. Oh, Trickster's Glass onto the Scion as well. You can itemize Scion as much as you want here and make him very, very difficult to deal with. Scion with Trickster's Glass is really actually getting four Scions because each Scion comes back. I will say that it feels like this Gwen 1 is really not doing anything, so I would still have like to move the items. But maybe we still can get that second place guarantee. It doesn't look like we're going to be able to get first place. That Noxus board is coming for that top two. We also have a Kaisa 3 out. Sells his Yasuo, so we can move these items back onto the Kaisa. Finds Gwen 2, recognizing that the Yasuo is not really doing anything important. And so this is the board that we've been looking for, but we have to avoid the Zephyr. And the Zephyr didn't actually hit the Kaisa or the Kalista. This is actually a great setup for us. So that Zephyr dodge was really huge and should lead us to be favoring this matchup. And you can see Kalista slowly but surely working on all these champions one by one. 3,300 crits, 15,000 damage from this Kalista 3 with early education stacks since stage 2-1. That was a big win. Does that get us to that top two? No, the third place player is still streaking. I will say that I think positioning is still really important. You want to put Scions close to the center because he ends up charging towards the enemy carries. Although his opponent does have a Quicksilver, so it's less important. He's trying to have his Scion take a little bit more aggro and distribute the damage to his secondary row after the Scions charge in. But his opponent does have some really good Augments, Know Your Enemy, and Transfusion. The four Failure Stun is really big. Uh-oh, the fall. <gasps> oh my goodness gracious, our Kalista's dead. We're dead. And that Zeri board ends up killing us, which means that we end in a third place. You can't believe it. That was exact lethal too. Let me rewind. Was that exact lethal? Oh my God, that was 18 damage. Look at his face. <laughs> He's in disbelief as well. Oh man, I think Shunga was robbed out of a top two. This was a really cool top two, but I guess the Zeri board was way too strong. And he has some really powerful combinations, I think, with things like the Death Defiance on this Urgot with the four Freljord. Like, it, it's actually quite insane how powerful his opponent's board is with things like the Transfusion and Know Your Enemy. All right, so there you have it. Shunga gets a third place, but honestly, that was a top one in all of our hearts. Really cool choices across the board. I don't think I would have chosen any of those augments. I would have probably gone for a completely different line, but I do like his early education pick. I think the tomes were really interesting, but in the end, I think that this game was super hard to play. And then I had the benefit of hindsight analysis as well as, you know, pausing and thinking. He had to go in full motion while climbing at 2000 LP Challenger. I hope this goes to show you why China is such a fun region to watch. And also that cooking in TFT still exists. I think a lot of people feel like you don't get the opportunity to improvise and make things up and play weird spontaneous boards because the meta is solved this late into the set. But that's not true at all. Shunga picked some augments that I think most people do not even dare touch and was able to follow through with a really good finish. So what do you guys think of Shunga's play? Did he do anything specifically that caught your eye that maybe I didn't bring up or I misevaluated? I'm always interested in hearing your guys' thoughts in the comments below, and I'll see you guys in the next video. If you want to check out Shunga's stream, here's the link to it. It's at Douyu, which is a streaming site in China. So probably get out your translator programs because you might need help navigating around, but definitely worth a watch if you get a chance. I was really proud of the way Shunga played this game. It is some fun and good TFT. In the end, you can see why this guy was a worthy world champion.